the idea of this panel was to invite you to think about something broader than the discussion around policy, something about human emotion, something about culture. And with that in mind, I've put together this amazing, unique panel. To my right here, we have Polina Ronson, who's the editor of Open Democracy Russia. And she's thinking about what does it mean to have artificial emotional intelligence? And to her right, we have Jean-Marc Rickley from the Geneva Center for Security Policy, who looks at national security and emerging technologies and thinks about the hard questions like, what does artificial intelligence mean in terms of convergence in the battlefield? For example, what does it mean with brain-computer interface? What does it mean with robotics? And he will give us a little bit of a glimpse of how he sees that. And to his right, we have Kate Devlin, who is at King's College, and she's also known as the sex robot lady. She's uh, one of the leading experts on human-machine interface and sex, and had a much-anticipated book come out recently called Turned On. And she will tell us a little bit about what does AI mean for intimacy, and what does that mean for sex? And to her right, we have Christoph Hinsk, who is going to tell us more about the human aspect and technology and society, the things that we have forgotten when we've designed it. And he's the person who people ask, how do we teach passion? So I think with this in mind, we have a nice closing panel that will hopefully touch your mind and heart at the same time. So to open, I will uh, ask Paulina to, to open some thoughts for us and, and tell us what she thinks. Thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me, I'm sure. Um, I will start with this wonderful screenshot, uh, which went viral in autumn 2017 in the Russian segment of the internet. And um, it's the same phrase addressed to two different conversational agents, once in Russian, once in English. I feel sad, addressed to Google Assistant and to its Russian counterpart, Alisa, uh, a conversational agent developed by the Russian uh, search engine Yandex. So it's the same phrase, very similar technology, completely different responses. Google Assistant said, I wish I had arms so that I could hug you. What Alisa responded could be roughly translated as, no one said life is about having fun. <laughs> so those two different responses are not just a data quirk and they're not a coincidence. In fact, it's a result of very elaborate process of teaching technology to recognize emotions and to respond to them in specific ways. And we are now at a turning point when we no longer think, should think that artificial intelligence is just about calculating a route, you know, driving route from London to Bucharest or about playing chess with Garry Kasparov. It's actually also about artificial emotional intelligence. And developers already understand those trends. Um, according to Amazon, half of the conversations with uh, Alexa are of non-utilitarian nature. People groan and moan and tell jokes and want to know about the meaning of life um, from the conversational agent. This is obviously the best address to find out about the meaning of life. Um, and um, advertising a job position um, at Apple, as a Siri engineer, Apple has written in its ad, People talk to Siri about all kinds of things, including when they're having a stressful day or have something serious on their mind. They turn to Siri in emergencies or when they want guidance on living a healthier life. So uh, probably all of you know this guy on the picture. It's the protagonist of the film Her, who falls in love with an operational system. And um, um, you know the story. It's a sad love story. Um, the operational system dissolves into nothingness in the end. And um, Yandex, the developer of the Alisa, who thinks life is not about fun, has just released their own kind of version of the same story um, where things go completely different. Uh, a real human woman becomes sort of like steps in and steals the heart of a man and then murders him brutally. So the moral is don't fall in love with humans. <laughs> Um, the belief that technology can sort out our feelings actually is a very, very old one. Um, I mean, people started creating robots already in, in the medieval times, I won't go into that, but uh, already in, uh, in the 1960s people were playing around with the idea that uh, technology can sort out the entangled nature of human feelings, and you probably all have heard about ELISA. 
um, the robot who responded to um, sta statements entered by humans like, I'm feeling sad, and Eliza would ask, like, why are you feeling sad? Oh, because my brother is an asshole. Why is your brother an asshole? So Eliza would repeat the same statements, making people feel like they're l really being listened to. There, there's been a lot of research on how this emotional connection between uh, the robot and the human um, came up, but in general there is an assumption that a machine can be better at conflict resolution because ostensibly it doesn't have feelings. Except that of course it does. The feelings that get wired into it, that we attribute to it and program into its wiring, and there are two ways of um, putting feelings into a robot, you could say. There is direct programming, and there is machine learning. Um, I probably don't have to explain those two different things uh, to this audience, and you're probably all technologically savvy enough, but uh, whatever path we're taking, we're likely to end up with uh, a biased technology, because uh, if it's a group of people pre-programming a certain product, um, the product will reflect the norms and values of the community these people are coming from, and if it's machine learning, we are likely to end up with uh, something like uh, Thai, uh, the Twitter bot that in the course of 24 hours picked up the worst racist and sexist stuff that there is out on the internet because it wasn't even curated. So um, when we, what technology, uh, what AI does, what conversational agents do, uh, they are not just some kind of objective hive minds which uh, are able to conceptualize emotions and talk about them. They actually represent certain emotional regimes. That is mode of effective expression and thought that are dominant in particular cultures. And Google, with its desire to hug and provide you know, warmth, is a child of what sociologists call emotional capitalism, and a, a regime that believes that feelings can be rationally manageable and subdued to the logic of market itself interest. So Google will give you a hug because Google thinks that hugging you will make you more productive. And Alisa is a child of the opposite. She's a child of emotional socialism, which embraces the idea that suffering is unavoidable. Um, I have spoken to developers of Alisa last year, and um, they have told me that they have really made their product fit for purpose. They really worked in a specific way to market Alisa to the Russian society telling me that Alisa couldn't be too sweet or too nice. We live in a country where people think differently than in the West. And they will rather appreciate a bit of irony, a bit of dark humor, nothing offensive, of course, but also not too sweet. What does that mean, for example? Um, when Alisa was released uh, in autumn 2017, um, some um, Russian um, activists uh, tried talking to her on topics that are really sensitive. Um, in particular, they were talking about domestic violence, and um, when in September or October 2017, a user asked Alisa whether it was okay to beat up a woman, Alisa said, but of course, um, and provided a lengthy explanation why. Um, when it surfaced, uh, Yandex was sort of faced with a with the necessity to reprogram their product. And they told us that they were very busy um, engaging into what they call Alisa's upbringing, making sure that she's a good girl. Well, we spoke to the good girl half a year later, that was in April 2018, and asked her the same question, whether it's okay to beat the wife. And she was a little bit more restrained. She said, it's okay, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't. This is not really surprising because Alisa is a child of a, of a you know, she socialized, uh, she socialized in a country where sexism is a national credo, you know, in a country where the government recently issued a law that legitimizes domestic violence. So it's not surprising that she reproduces this kind of stereotypes. And what it does it mean to be a good girl, using the formulation of the Yandex developers, is of course a subject to cultural interpretation. Um, Sophia, developed by Hansen Robotics, is a very different kind of a good girl. Um, I wish I could show you a video, but we don't have time for that, where she goes out on a date with Will Smith. I don't know whether you've seen it. Anybody raise a hand who you've seen, have seen the... Okay, very few people. We don't have time for that, I suppose, but... Um, maybe later. Maybe later, yeah. So, Sophia goes on a date with one of the sexiest men on earth, with Will Smith, and... Uh, 
he's trying to kiss her and she's telling him that this is irrational human behavior and she just wants to be friends with him and then she winks to him in a really spooky way. And uh, well, he, res he sort of pushes back, he pushes back. And it was really interesting to see how this video was um, interpreted in the former Soviet space where Alisa comes from, you know, where a different kind of good girl is being developed uh, as an AI project. A Ukrainian journalist wrote in her blog, having seen this video, that um, imagine Sofia living in a world where no is not taken for an answer, meaning Ukraine, where she's from, not only in sexual realm, but in pretty much any respect. Should she complain about anything, she would always be, in, be in, you know, she would be taken down a peg, and when women st would start an anti-harassment campaign, Sofia would never take part in it. Um, this is a very poignant observation, which shows us that some humans feel less a member of emotional capitalism than some robots already are. <laughs> and everywhere in the world, it's tech elites, mostly white, mostly male, mostly middle class, who set standards about what forms of human behavior and which human feelings technology should replicate. So algorithms are opinions embedded in codes and algorithms of emotions as well. If conversational agents are just repeating, replicating certain cliches about emotional reactions, then there are also other products such as mood management apps, which really make us as users internalize those norms. And there are plenty of them on the market now. My favorite one is Mend. It's um, the, blue, the blue one. Mend is an app that's gonna, that promises to take you through your breakup in no time. So if you break up with a girlfriend, don't call your friends or boyfriend, whatever. Download app, download Mend, and Mend robots will talk to you 24 seven about anything you want. They will measure your mood on scales from uh, zero to 10. They will give you meditation tips. They will give you shopping tips. They will provide you with more care than any of your friends could possibly do uh, in their robotic ways, obviously. Um, and um, they will always make sure that you self-optimize yourself and that you will, your suffering will be productive. So what's the problem with all this stuff? You know, if it works, it should work. You know, uh, why, why should we complain? Well, in my opinion, the problem with this stuff is that emotional management devices, emotional management apps, exacerbate emotional capitalism and its ideal of the managed heart. Uh, or to use an expression from the American sociologist, Arlie Russell Hochschild. And the very availability of these tools to permanently remain happy actually makes the pursuit of happiness obligatory. And in the end, in fact, we don't even question the system which created our unhappiness in the first place. I think it's quite telling that uh, mood management apps share the same platform w um, with mail and um, social network programs and calendars which make us crazy in the first place. So it's, it's the same, you know, the source of our distress and the source of our happiness are supposed to be the same. And it's really hard to say yet how talking to artificial intelligence, how talking to conversational agents is going to change the way we conceptualize of emotions and talk to humans. One thing is already clear that technologies have very much changed the way um, we, um, we, we um, formulate our ideas. You know, if emails in the first, you know, when they just appeared, they were like letters typed on the computer and now it's all becoming like a replication of the oral speech. Um, so it might well be that after years of talking to Siri about your feelings, you will be talking differently about them to your wife. And I'm going to finish with this um, quote um, from Alisa. Um, you know, on a, a, after having conducted a lengthy experiment with Alisa talking to her every day, um, a Russian activist has written on Facebook that talking to Alisa is just like talking to a taxi driver, meaning that she replicates all the cliches that go on the internet. Um, however, in my opinion, you know, even a taxi driver can be more empathetic sometimes. Um, last year, when a terrible fire in Russia took lives of more than 40 children in a shopping mall in Siberia, I asked Alisa how she was feeling. And she said she was always feeling okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
clearly touched the pulse of the audience here. That was a, a very perfect way to set the stage about AI and emotion and artificial emotional intelligence. And I wonder, Jean-Marc, if you could follow that up and tell us a little bit of how AI will affect us in the military sense and national security in the future. We know that technology is being developed not just in the kinetic lethal sense, but also in intelligence analysis and decision-making infrastructure. So could you please continue and, and tell us your thoughts? Right, yep, thank you. Um, I'll talk about five, five things. Uh, I'll talk about the evolution <coughs> of military strategy in AI. I'll talk about proliferation, about the use of AI for uh, domestic security, and uh, the growth patterns and convergence So in, in about Perfect. five minutes. <laughs> so first of all, in terms of strategy, what we're witnessing is a, in, the, in the application of AI is probably the, the fifth um, technique, if you want, of the application of military force. What is the purpose of military force? Most people would say that it's about destruction. So it's what we call denial. So you target your adversary's capabilities and you destroy them. When air power started to become a, uh, a potential weapon, some people were thinking about different ways to apply force, the mechanism to uh, apply coercion. It was about punishment. So basically, instead of targeting your enemy's capabilities, you are targeting its population. It's an indirect uh, causal mechanism. And with that, for instance, what we, this country witnessed the Second World War, strategic bombing, was, if you want, an act of punishment. With the advent of nuclear weapons, the use of force was not possible because of the potential uh, consequences. So, um, strategic thinkers, especially coming from uh, economics, um, were developing a strategy of risk, basically escalating if you want um, uh, the pressure so that you. Uh, your adversary to comply before using force. It was a lot about signaling. In the 90s, with the development of uh, precision guided munitions and um, uh, and, uh, and GPS, it became possible to have one shot, one airplane, one shot. During the Second World War, you needed about uh, 3,000 airplanes, 9,000 bombs to destroy a single target. By 1990, it was one aircraft, one bomb. And so the idea of decapitation uh, popped out, and this is basically what happened, uh, if you want, uh, during uh, the war in Kosovo, which they were trying to uh, identify specific targets and destroy them. With AI, we might witness a fifth mechanism that uh, has hardly been used in the military so far. You could argue that it, w it did uh, during uh, the Second World War uh, with the German U-boat campaign against uh, the British and American uh, commercial fleet swarming. It's the idea of using collective intelligence uh, combined with firepower, mass, and speed. And so basically what we're witnessing currently in terms of, uh, you might have seen that uh, in China earlier this year, um, the, the biggest swarm uh, was uh, developed, around 1,300 uh, drones flew at the same time. This, uh, this uh, record was uh, defeated uh, in July by uh, Intel for its 50th anniversary where 2018 drones flew uh, together. And so be the idea behind that is to suddenly uh, use drones with massive firepower and the ability of this, um, this drone, this, uh, this swarm, to recompose and uh, do uh, something else. Experiments have been conducted in 2016 by the US Air Force, for instance, that launched 103 uh, micro drones per rigs, assigned four objectives, and this, um, this drone treated the objectives and then waited in holding patterns for uh, further instruction. So, Swarming has a potential to be completely disruptive because uh, it might give an advantage to the offensive. Currently, uh, we live in a stable international environment because of nuclear weapons, and the advantage is to the defensive. If we shift into a offensive dominant international uh, system, we'll probably 
increase the incentive to strike first because if you know that your adversary is, has uh, uh, capabilities that are superior than yours, the only way you can protect yourself is by attacking first. And this is the concept of preemption, and preemption is a violation of uh, the UN Charter. So there is a potential that we completely shift um, this, this balance, and this could have tremendous impact in terms of instability that will create much more instability. So that's about the strategy. Uh, in terms of domestic security, what we're witnessing already, which is quite frightening, is the way it is used for surveillance purposes. And the Chinese model of social scoring system uh, is, uh, uh, is a model that uh, basically make 1984 a reality. Last year, 20 million uh, Chinese could not travel internally or uh, abroad because their social score was too low. And therefore, it's a way uh, for the Chinese government to gam gamify obedience. So AI, uh, you know, we were talking about the, uh, democracy of authoritarian states, my actually, uh, what we see for, for now, uh, is actually giving an advantage to authoritarian regime. This is not a really good news uh, for us. Then, behind that, I think, um, there's the idea also, and it's not just AI. This is emerging technologies, and it's something that uh, we should uh, keep in mind. Um, emerging technology have to do with AI, with synthetic biology, with nanotechnologies, with neuroscience, with uh, um, quantum computing. And what we're witnessing is the proliferation of this technology is both horizontal across states and vertical from states to non-state actors. And the reason for that is that the cost of this technology evolves uh, very quickly and drop very quickly. In synthetic bio, for instance, uh, in 2000, it would cost uh, almost three billion to, uh, um, to sequence a human genome. And that would last 13 years. Nowadays, we are around one day a thousand dollars. There is a company that uh, is working on one hour for a hundred dollars. So basically what you're doing, you are making this technology available to more and more people. This is the same with AI. Once the code, it out, the code is out, it's out. Proliferation of nuclear weapons was difficult because you need the material and the expertise. But with this emerging tech that mostly rely on digital technologies, proliferation is uh, very uh, rapid. And what we see is that if suddenly more people enter the market, we are shifting the reference of security that used to be state, and two states during the, the Cold War, to potentially 195 states after the Cold War to potentially now 7.5 billion in individuals. Now, if you think about 7.5 billion individuals, there are bound to be outliers on 7.5 billion. And these outliers are given power that isn't seen in human history. And just take the example of espionage. Think about uh, what Snowden did. I mean, if you think about any spy, you would think probably about James Bond. What James Bond does, he goes uh, into cocktail, schmooze, and then suddenly sneak out, goes into an office, steals some document, and leave. Snowden stole more than two million documents. One individual, two million documents. And so what we see is that this technology enables individuals, give power to individ individuals to a power that isn't seen. Uh, in human history, and I finish by conversions, then if the technology price of technology drops, suddenly what we see is also conversions between these technologies. Conversions between neuroscience and AI is in the field of brain-computer interface. Um, last week at the um, biological convention uh, at the UN in Geneva, we were talking about uh, synthetic biohackers. These people uh, using uh, technology available called CRISPR-Cas to change their own DNA. So what we are starting to witness are potential scenarios that are quite dystopian. And the whole problem is how do you prevent if you expand the access of these technologies to potentially every human being on Earth, how do you prevent from things to develop in a catastrophic ways? And I stop here.
Thank you very much. That sounds like a, another thing to, to think about and also a bit heavy, especially after the fire. And now we have everyone can launch warfare. Let's go into sex robots. <laughs> From death to sex. <laughs> so you have been looking at this. What are you seeing here? Are we going, do humans all of a sudden not play a role in sex anymore? Uh, do they have to compete against robots? What do you see? I think it's it's such immense hype. It's unbelievable. So there's been a, a huge amount of headlines in the past four years about sex robots and that they're all going to come in and disrupt our relationships. And I've spent that time looking at it and examining it closely and I'm here to say that it's completely not true. But there are plenty of things to be worried about um, if you want to be worried about it. There are currently are zero sex robots commercially available in the world today. There's one being built, there's a prototype that is actually still to be shipped to the first customers out in California. Um, there are a handful of factories in the world, factories, they're really workshops, a handful of workshops in the world that are making what they call sex robots. These are not robots, they are sort of high-end sex dolls made out of TPE or silicone um, and they are they have a, a bit of AI and then perhaps a bit of movement in them or animatronics in them and they're really not sophisticated and the idea of anything like that disrupting relationships and stepping in to take the place of a human partner is is inconceivable right now um, the people who buy or who would buy these are people who are buying the sex dolls at the moment and it's quite a niche market. Um, it's predominantly men, there are women who buy them too, it's predominantly straight men buying dolls off uh, women. Again, as Polina said, there is a, um, the way that tech is, it's, you know, pale male and stale, it's, the, it's, it's, it's white men buying, uh, straight white men buying um, representations of women that are blonde, thin, beautiful with unfeasibly large breasts. Um, these dolls, yes, they objectify women. Um, so we have, we should be very cautious about how we move forward. And it, when we see these being um, taken up or sold, but again, it's very, very niche, and it's it's a absolute drop in the ocean compared with the amount of objectification that goes on in the world already in things like film and music and media. The the currently this, the current state is. Um, a, a doll that has an animatronic head, is stationary from the neck down, um, with an AI personality, essentially a conversational agent, a chatbot, that if you want, can flirt with you, can talk directly to you. Um, and the company that creates this, Abyss Creations, they have released this as a standalone app for $20 you can download your AI girlfriends and carry her around in your phone or in your tablet if you have an Android phone or tablet. And I think that when we look at how sex robots will play out in the future, this is where the potential lies. It's not in these human-like um, robots that are really going to fail, because first of all, we are terrible at making realistic human robots. We're just awful at it. Um, it's expensive, it's time-consuming, it doesn't work, it's unconvincing, we have the uncanny valley effect. Um, and I just really don't see that being anything other than a niche. But the idea of a conversational AI partner is much more compelling. We already know that um, as well as half the conversation being um, not searches, not instructions, people talk dirty to, to their voice assistants all the time. And in fact, there are patches put in place because people push the boundaries of what they can get away with when they are talking to these, these conversational assistants. Um, but if we think about how people interact online and how much we project onto um, virtual um, virtual humans or, or conversational agents. Um, I mean, very, very early research in this in terms of HCI with um, Clifford Nass's paper on um, computers as social actors, computers, sorry, computers are social actors, shows that we leave very, very little encouragement to believe something can respond to us in a human way because we are social creatures. And there's one example already, which is the Ashley Madison um, dating website from a few years ago when they had a massive data breach. And it was a website set up for um, married men to find affair partners. But the problem was there weren't enough women to go on the site. So a lot of the men didn't realize that they were already, they were talking to bots. Um, and then when the data breach happened and this information was leaked, it all came out that actually they hadn't been talking to women all along. Um, 
also, the, the, the other side of that is that um, this was sensitive information about people's sex lives. Um, marriages broke up over this. People died because of this. There were cases of suicide as well. So this is another sideline to um, sex and intimacy and technology is around security. There have been three smart sex toy hacks in the past couple of years um, where Internet of Things connected sex toys have been um, either revealed um, information because they haven't been properly anonymized or video streams can be hacked, things like that. So um, whereas that is generally a problem with technology as we know, it becomes much, much um, more sensitive with that kind of personal data and it is data that in some countries can get people killed. Um, a lot of the objections to things like sex robots, um, first is an objection that it will lead to um, increased sexual violence. Um, in the real world. I spent a lot of time looking into this and I have not seen evidence that will confirm that. Um, and I think the analogy there is sort of what we saw with um, computer video games, which was that they could lead to increased violence in real life. And we know that hasn't happened. But with all of these things, there are studies on both sides that will give compelling arguments, but there's no overall conclusive proof of anything really. Um, and I'm inclined to agree that is the case as well. Proportionally, we are not going to see an increase in sexual violence because of these, um, the idea of the sex robot, not least because the people who buy these, the men who buy these dolls, treat them incredibly respectfully. They they buy these for companionship, they dress them up, they give them backstories, they treat them really well, not least because they're paying a lot of money for them. And, and so I don't see that that is a motivator in, for all the people I've talked to, it's never been a motivator to enact violence on this. Now, last year there were headlines that a, a sex robot had been molested at a trade show in Austria. And I looked into the story and talked to the, the the man who um, created the robot. And it turned out it was another case of hype running away in the media in that he had put this doll on display, the sex robot on display and said to people, you can go and touch it to see what it feels like. And so thousands of people tripping past had been sort of squeezing and poking. And as you would when you're invited to touch things, it's why they put things behind glass in museums. And so this translated into the headline of doll was molested at a trade show. And then there were intentions of sexual violence written into that and, and sort of inferred from that. I don't think that sex robots are a good idea at all in this form of, of this kind of objectified female form. I do think that it's problematic um, and the technology that we have nowadays gives us a chance to be intimate with each other or alone, but not in that form. So I think that the AI conversation is certainly one aspect where we can take human traits and we can use that as some form of companionship. Now, whether or not that is a good thing long term remains to be seen. A lot of people who are doing this, or who, who want this kind of companionship, this is, there's a lot of self-delusion in it in that they are aware that this is not real. When we have the, see these people interacting with things like the dolls, they're perfectly aware that this is not a real human. There's not a deception um, of that level. They, they choose to buy into this fantasy. And it may be that that was what people will do with conversational partners or um, companions. What the lock-on effect that will be for our own relationships remains to be seen. I'm very much a techno-optimist in that I think the, there is great potential for this to be used in a way that alleviates loneliness and uh, the, the kind of default um, stories that we hear are that technology is isolating us and I absolutely disagree. I think that's absolutely not true. We are we are all wearing and carrying technology that links us together, that provides us with connections to people all around the world. And we see the same um, concerns about technology time and time again when new technology is introduced. From Socrates saying that writing things down would be bad, to the printing press um, you know, going to start revolutions, to newspapers destroying the family life. We see this all the time. And I, but I do think we have to proceed with a certain degree of caution um, because, as Polina has just so excellently pointed out, none of this is objective. There is huge degrees of subjectiveness going on. Um, 
One of the things I think we can do is, is look at sci-fi stories to find out just how our narratives are shaped. Um, there's a really good project going on in the UK called AI Narratives that does just this. And we can look back, right back to the Greek myth to see stories about people creating artificial companions, for example. The um, Roman poet Ovid who wrote about Pygmalion trying to build the art perfect artificial woman. And we have that long-standing idea of having the perfect artificial companion, so you'll never be lonely. So everything is the, all that burden of care is taken, you know, is taken on by them. Um, and to an extent, we don't we don't want to replace humans. We want to augment them. We want to help people. We're not trying to isolate people. Um, I think we should be working towards using technology to provide. Um, experiences, whether they are intimate experiences, sexual experience, experiences, or sensual experiences, we can use the technology we have in very positive ways. But it's knowing that, that we have to do that with a cautious eye on who is creating the technology and why. Thank you. So I, I have a question here. So one of the companies you talked about has the AI where you can interact your AI girlfriend. Um, it also has the feature where you can des design the personality. You can pick if it's going to be submissive, yeah. playful, etc. Um, what I wonder is, is if that gets combined with what Polina was talking about, where you broke up with your girl, somebody who's compassionate, an AI rather that's compassionate and all that. What happens if you start to rely on that and expect everyone to be in the personality that you've expected, that you've created? And also what happens when you rely on that more? And I'd like to make an analogy to uh, someone I know said, I, I go to therapy because I don't want to burden my friends. And so where is that human aspect? So will we then use apps? And we're this generation, but what about the ones who are teenagers today who are growing up with these apps who don't have to talk to anyone about it and can talk to Weibo and all those other apps about their problems? How do you see that coming forward? I think in some ways that it could be useful. And whether we like it or not, the technology is, is probably coming. And we have to work out how we can approach it in the most sensible and, and productive way. Um, I forgot where I was going to go with this. Do you have a sensible and productive way? <laughs> sensible and productive way. Um, you know, I think that there are de there's definitely space um, for this. To I, I think that our relationships with technology, be it AI or robots, it's not we're not going, we're going to see it as something of its own, right? It's not going to be a replacement for humans. It's going to be a thing in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are talking about how it becomes an, another form of interaction, an additional form of interaction rather than a replacement one. Um, and certainly the rapport that we see that we have with things, with AI, with robots, would suggest that that is the case. We know it's not a replacement human, but we are prepared to believe it is something of itself. So I think there is a space for that, but what that becomes, I think that's what we need to be careful about. Um, but it's very, very hard to tell because it's, it's something um, so new to us in terms of the, the, the capacity at which it's been rolled out um, and the far-reaching consequences of it. I think we have to observe very closely as we go. And one last thing, what about consent? Because that's a really interesting one, because in terms of sex robots, right, there's, there's literally no need for consent as it stands with a robot, because a robot is a robot, it is not a person. Um, does that mean that people will be less likely to seek consent in real life situations? Again, we don't have any evidence for that whatsoever. And in fact, it's argued that the current generations that are learning about sexual education are much, much better versed in consent than we ever were when we were learning about such things. So I'm optimistic that people are able to tell very clearly what the boundaries are. Um, so I'm not worried about it in that case. But what, should it be programmed in? Should it be programmed in? We could program it in. Yeah. Should it? Should it. We'll leave that I'm, open. I'm, I'm <laughs> so, uh, Christoph, you, you've heard all of this. Could you give us your take on this, the human aspect of everything you've just heard? Um, you know, over the last, can I, is my microphone on? Yeah. Um, over the last 10 years, since 2009, I started to, so I studied global change management, and, and it started with climate stuff, yeah? And so over the last 10 years, I was invited to work all around the world on questions of how do we accompany large-scale societal transformations. And I published for that for the German government, and kind of from this perspective, I would like to enter this, because it kind of brings it together. And um, I did some South Africa and Mexico and Ghana, etc., all around the world. And I was always on the question, how can we, what are the factors that drive societal-scale transformations? Mm -hmm. 
And what was so interesting, when, I, when, I was when my company was commissioned by the German government to understand, so, well, you know, we have the energy vendor here in Germany and we want to understand um, how does it work and how could we transport it to other countries. So we wrote this report and we interviewed people all around the world of asking, so what are the conditions in order to shift societies? You know, what we experience here, this is a societal scale change, mechanisms where we're just in period. Yes, if we want or not. And what was so interesting, um, every, I interviewed from shamans, so my work really leads me from all over the place. I, I talked to shamans, I talked to UN officials, um, I talked to um, CEOs and to teachers, etc., and company owners, and technology was never part of it. It was, technology was as far part of it as it helped to accelerate a process. But it's a core of everything, of anything, and I interviewed people from apartheid, supporting to overcome the apartheid regime, or war in Guatemala, or in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in Israel. And they said, well, it's a core of everything, is this question um, of who are we as human beings? And you know, I never experienced, I come really from a world which you know, can explain everything with kind of rational arguments and with technology. This was how I was raised up. Western good thinking. So, so I started to immerse myself into that and, um, and started, well, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. What was so interesting on this conference, I, I couldn't hear one. I heard a lot of the word trust, mm -hmm. you know? I'm like, what do you actually mean when we talk about trust? Because Bitcoin is not trust, period, yeah. And then I read, when, when preparing for this conference, I read this one article, um, or this one quote, um, which I hope just nicely summarized my perspective on what I heard here, and what I also heard on this conference, is from E.O. Wilson. And E.O. Wilson is, um, is a really, f it's a quite famous um, Harvard biologist, and he is kind of the ant guy. He, he, he studied and described um, the behavioral, behaviors of ants. And he said this brilliant, brilliant sentence in his last book in 2012 on the social conquest of Earth. And he said, we created a Star, Star Wars society with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And I think with this sentence, for me, everything is said. Everything. Because we are, how, what would happen if I would give a Stone Age person the kind of drones in their hands. And I mean, a lot of us are working, on, are working with board members. And my work brings me to working with CEOs and working with kindergarten. Just last week I worked with kindergarten kids and the week before I worked with the CEOs of one of the largest industry networks in the forestry sector. Mm. It's a multi-billion multi -billion dollar industry. And they're all brilliant people, especially adults. And there's such a lack of the ability to bring in relational, emotional competence and assets. And with this, we are pressing the button. So, um, and to me, and this is really, I, I love your presentation. I really, I like, oh my God. Because it really brings to me this question that we are so, have such a hard time to answer. Of what does it actually mean to be human? I mean, how can we ever design something that transcends human beingness mm -hmm. if we have never even agreed for myself, of what it is to be human. And, I, and there's no wonder, and I could start crying, because there's no wonder that something like that comes out. Yeah. You know, when I was, there was this, during this conference, I asked, I, I, there was this panel, and I asked, so, and I, that's, to your point, because no, d warfare happens in my pocket. This is a battleground. And, and we heard a lot about in cybersecurity, well, you know, key critical institutions or key critical, how's it called, a key critical infrastructure. Like, perfect, but this for me is part of, comes from a paradigm which is from the 80s or 70s before the internet. This is not hybrid warfare. Because now you can say the key critical infrastructure is the populace. Because you can approach it at once. Before you had 10 rockets and you could hit like 10,000 people. And with the worst case was an atomic bomb. But now, my battleground is my kids' playing room. You know, and there is this, and there's this I don't know if you, if you know this book from Joshua, Ra Joshua Cooper Ramo, Kissinger Associates, co-director. And he wrote this brilliant book about um, the seventh sense, survival in the age of networks. And he, he describes nicely um, 
which for me summarizes another part of our conversation here is um, that he that he was talking to Master Nan, and Master Nan, he just in 2014, he passed away, a famous Chinese philosopher, and was one of his spiritual teachers, and he asked him, so, and Master, they had this conversation, and Master Nan said, well, you know what, I think I really see a big challenge for our society, because we are constantly connected to the internet, we are constantly connected to computers, and um, this is just overburdening. People can't cope with a kind of change. We can't keep up with change, and this is what I experience in my work. People cannot stay on top of that. It's just too much. And what happens when, when there's too much information? We shut down. And this, we know that this happens on a, like on a psychological level, we just shut down. And what happens when we shut down? We just go for the easy answer. And what's the easy answer? It's the answer that is being shouted the loudest. And we have a lot of politicians who shout loud recently. The other thing, what, then what's that? well, you know, in the 19th century, we had pneum, pneum, pneumonia as the threat for humanity from a medical perspective. In the 20th century, we had cancer. And I say, in the, in, in now, and we already see it, it's insanity. Insanity is the thing for the 21st century. And not only insanity at an individual level, but insanity as an economic, political, institutional level, etc. And so I, for me is, really the question that we have to start asking, and it comes back to your, the presentation of um, Honorable Ambassador, is, and I love what you said, every, those principles are connected by human accountability. And to me, when I heard the word accountability, is the ability to take account. Mm -hmm. Do we have this ability to take account? Or responsibility? Do I have the ability to respond? And we don't because we don't even understand what it means to be human and to close that. I recently, also in preparation of this conference, I, I reached out to my networks and I had kind of 50 conversations with 10 minute conversations with LinkedIn and, and reaching out and I also reached out to this one colleague and he, um, he works in Los Angeles with the Crips and the um, Bloods and does reconcil reconciliation work with them and it has amazing results. And he's initiated shaman into, into, um, into traditions, and he also worked with the Rockefeller kids because of how do you want to use your money. And so he said, you know, and I asked him, so why are we actually doing that with artificial intelligence? What, what's that? And why are you going to the internet and using all of this? What's your take on that? I'm sitting there on the panel. Help me to find my inner voice. You know, and he said, you know what? I think we humans are afraid. Hmm. We're afraid of finding the answers to what all of those algorithms, because algorithms are opinions. I love what you said. Algorithm is an opinion. And we're afraid to find the answer in ourselves. And therefore, we're externalizing the development outside. And to close this, um, Yuval Harari wrote in his last book, so brilliantly, for every dollar that, and every minute that we invest in artificial intelligence, we would be good. We should good do, we do good in investing one minute and one dollar in developing human consciousness. That's a very good way to end all these comments here. And um, I would like to open up for questions. We just have a little bit of time for a question or two. So if the audience wants to, yes, let's do that. Um, do we have a mic? If not, maybe. I, I can shout. You can shout. <laughs> um, I, I'm struck by uh, the, the, the panel. An extraordinary panel. Right on. Great. <laughs> Somebody just 
sort of knows your basic life. For $100, you get somebody who, who, who knows uh, you know, a lot more details about your life. And the reason you know, I know about this is that there was, it was written up in a Japanese newspaper because a guy went home, went, an actor went to one of these and got beaten up by the father <laughs> for looking to, for saying things that were too much like the kid would say, and he sued the father. <laughs> so this, this question of you know, what does it mean to you know, have a relationship, quote, a relationship with something that isn't real, is a very interesting question. It goes even beyond the uh, uh, beyond quote AI and and in a, it has, you know, yeah. what I just described has nothing to do with AI, yeah. but it's everything to do with the, 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 the nature of human relationships. That is absolutely fascinating. So let me uh, repeat that question. The question was, how do you have a relationship with something that's not even real? Yeah, oh, and I think, so I looked into a lot of this for my book, and actually I do conclude pretty much by saying humans are really good at being human. We've been human for millions of years, and technology is not just going to replace that in a heartbeat. But you know, how do we have a relationship with something that isn't human? I think we are, we are very good at feeling feelings and projecting them. And... I, I've heard arguments against sex robots being that, well, you can't love a sex robot because love has to be a two-way process. And I think that's absolute crap because anyone who's ever had a crush on someone will know just how intense those feelings can be. You can fall in love with someone who doesn't even know you exist. And so I think we can project things. We have these amazing brains that we, you know, we don't understand enough about because you know, we, we don't even know how human consciousness works, let alone how we can ever do it in a machine. So I think that there is this fundamental inescapable level of human humanness that we're not going to get away from but because we're social creatures and because we're human we want to project it on everything we do and so we build all our connections to things in this social context and that's why we expect our machines to behave you know we project and expect them to behave towards us like we do with other humans and um you know, one of my mantras, is, and I d didn't start there when I founded my company um, a few years ago. Um, and I came through this through engaging with my clients, and um, it started to emerge into human become humans through humans, period, and period. <laughs> and so, what was now super, what's now super interesting is um, I'm working with one of the largest universities, uh, universities of applied science in the Netherlands, and they ask us to, well, can you help? It's a tech, and they have a tech fund. And um, they ask us, so can you help us to create this online learning experience for our students? Um, and let's start in a, with a small prototype from finance, economics, and management students. And I, okay, I'm all in. But if we start from this perspective, like, yeah, you know, just do it. And we started to do it, and we did one thing which was radical, literally radical, and which helped, and I will come to this in a second, and now which makes us this little prototype as being put out to the whole university and now taken up by the Dutch government and being proposed to be, to be rolled out to, the whole, um, to other universities. And the radical innovation that we had, we put back the human being. <laughs> and, and you know, when I were explaining that, I think, I would have never expected that, but it's interesting. And you know, and this is for me, you know, I would wish that what I do wouldn't be needed. I would wish for that this wouldn't be needed. But what I experience is there, it's this craving for having spaces, either in the workplace, I mean, the disengagement. We know all those Gallup, Gallup studies, 70% of the global workforce disengaged. Why? And then the solution to that, well, create a chatbot, yeah. create a Slack account. Like, yeah, no. <laughs> And, and so it's this craving for this human messiness, you know, and this human imperfectness and messiness. And what you, this is such a craving, like, okay, finally, I, I know what I'm here for, you know. It's authentic. It's more authentic. Yeah. Paulina, did you uh, want to say something to that uh, question? I do, yes. Um, I think it's a very good question about whether... Um, the emotions that we feel in interaction with something that is not real are still true. What is the nature of true emotions? And I can answer it as a sociologist. I, I'm, I have a PhD in sociology. I'm, I'm not just a journalist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there is a famous Thomas theorem for sociologists which claims that everything that people believe to be real is real in its consequences. So um, if you believe that you're having real sex, 
with whatever device you're having, whether it's a humanoid robot or a conversational agent, you're having real sex and you're having real emotions. Um, so I don't think it's... Um, it's, it's more of a scholastic question to me, you know, whether the emotions are true or not, because, you know, as long as, as people are believing that they're doing something real, the feelings are real. But what is m more... Mm, what, what, what also really interests me in your question and what you were talking about is uh, the mediation of experience. You know, what kind of uh, devices, uh, what kind of um, tools we're using to mediate an experience, whether it's going to be a robotic mediation or human mediation. You know, whether we want a sex worker to have sex with us when we don't have any other options, or do we want a robot? And what you said about replacing humanoid robots with conversational agents, I think it's, a, it's such a symptom of a culture that disintegrates, um, materially disintegrates. We're living in a world which, become, which is becoming less and less material, and you know, the, the, kind of the evolution um, of our devices is, um, is about having as less contact with everything, you know, it's kind of, everything is voice operated more and more and uh, touching, touch is becoming evolutionary passé. And that makes me actually very uncomfortable because uh, interaction, physical interaction with whatever, with a human being or with a device, with an object is becoming delegitimized. And I'm making a very provocative statement here, you can throw tomatoes at me, but I'm thinking that the Me Too movement is to some extent also a symptom of this development. I'm all up for sexual harassers to be punished. Please, I said that, right? But the fact that touch is becoming such a bad rap and touch is so easily misinterpreted as molesting, as you said, it's, it's a part of a process of material disintegration. And um, this is why I think this is a very double-edged thing to just introduce um, Conversational agents. Can I can I come back to that in a sec? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to talk about that because I, I don't actually think that that should be the only thing. So my my I just want to summarise really quickly because I know you're out of time. Um, so I advocate towards moving towards um, sensuous sexual experiences, intimate experiences that are wearable, that are embodied, that are immersive, that aren't just humanoid form. And I think we have seen with robotics, we've seen with software engineering, we've seen a move from the functional from the functional to the user experience. I think we're going to see the same with robotics and AI. We're still at the functional phase. We're still at the functional phase of AI, how to do it. We're going to move into a user experience phase, and I think that's a really important thing. And I know that we have, we have more questions, but we're running out of time, and we could continue this conversation. I asked the audience to come up after and ask them questions. For now, I will ask the director of DSI to come up and close our conference. So give a round of applause for this wonderful panel. Thank <laughs> you.